Welcome to the Behavioral View. everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone and welcome to season two, episode three of the Behavioral View, where you are here with your usual CR panel. I'm here with Carrie Millico and Nissa Van Etten and I'm Shannon Hill. And we are so excited today to be joined by Shannon Biagi, who is the founder and CEO of Chief Motivating Officers. And she is delighting us today with all talk about OBM type topics, right? Yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we are so excited to have you here. But before we launch into everything, I do want to take just a second to say, uh, very special welcome. We actually do have a new member. We used to have Nissa Van Etten, but now we have Dr. Nissa Van Etten. So we just need to get her. Thank you. Huge accomplishment. Huge. And Shannon, we like to do kind of a soft intro, let people kind of get to know us. And uh, I think we decided today we're going to talk about uh, what do you do to combat burnout? Mm. All right. Yeah. So who wants to talk about their burnout remedies or prevention strategies? I'll go. All right. Okay. Um, I was thinking about this question and I have just because I saw it 10 minutes ago. Um, so I was like, oh, I got to prepare. Uh, <laughs> but I have two ways of answering this is one is helping deal with burnout with people that I work with and then one helping burnout with myself. So when I used to work in the clinic, um, I would always make sure that, um, I provided proper supervision, like ample amounts of supervision, more than the uh, base requirement that is dictated by the BACB. Because what I found at the, at adequate levels of supervision for my staff, they were, not uh, as frantic or feeling like they were left on their own. They always had me to go to. um, And that helped with their burnout as well as um, another thing was, um, was with that supervision, having it being frequent as opposed to like long stretches. So the time could have been the same, but I saw that when I distributed my time with my staff, Uh, to shorter amounts of time, but more often meeting with them, that helped as well. And then also getting to know them as people other than just the people that I'm supervising in that very professional sense. So knowing, you know, that their favorite foods or what movies that they love, like just things that we may have uh, gathered in side conversations. So that way it created a rapport and I and you know I obviously cared for them deeply as um as I, I tend to be a little mama bear but uh, mama hen but <laughs> mama bear is uh, but mama hen's like oh um but uh but so that way I created an, I really wanted to create an environment so that way when they if they felt stressed they could come to me and feel safe and know that they would be listened to and it would be supportive as opposed to dismissed um, so, uh, those are things I did for them, but for myself, I need to, um, like sometimes take a 15 minute walk, like a, a loop around my neighborhood in the middle of the day, need to get out of the screen time, need to get some sunshine. And I will listen to something that is non-work related. So, uh, and sometimes sometimes it can't even be heavy either. Like right now I'm listening to uh, a sci-fi uh, book. Uh, so it has to be something allows me to just connect to other interests in my life. Um, 
as opposed to being like, oh, I'm going to go for a walk, but I'm also going to listen to a podcast about behavior analysis or about product management or something like that, where I feel like I kind of, like my body feels like it's still working. Yeah. So, yeah. Really yeah I, lo- go for I it. love that. You, I love that you took it in that direction because that's actually where I went to, which was more of the, not only focusing on the mitigation of burnout ourselves, and that is something to be mindful of, but, you know, there is this huge emphasis in our field on self-care. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we've got folks that are seeing a lot of burnout on their teams, typically what's happening is it's a systems problem. So mm-hmm. it's only appropriate that the OBM practitioner mm-hmm. would, would bring in the systems, um, you know, bubble baths and yoga and, you know, all of those things that we tend to focus on and say, oh, well, you just, you need to take more walks. Um that can only do so much for a person when they're overscheduled and they're underpaid and they're doing really tough work with little appreciation, with insecure schedules. Um, so I wanted to go in the direction of, you know, leaders taking a step back and looking at the situations that you have your staff in and say, you know, if I was in their shoes, would I also be feeling burnt out? And if, yeah, maybe look at how you could change some of those things. So everything else, um, the focus on on self care is really just a band aid, on top of you know systemic issues that we we probably need to resolve not only as individual leaders but as a field in general. So I love that you went in that direction with it too. Thanks, and you just made me want to ask you a follow up question, but I will wait until everyone else <laughs> answers. <laughs> I was just thinking, wow, we should have let her go last so that we I know, know right? <laughs> <laughs> Nissa, you can follow that. <laughs> yeah, I would love to follow that. I I had so many thoughts when Carrie was speaking about, you know, that supervision practice and supporting RBTs when you're going in there. I think in a similar vein, when I jump in for supervision, I do a lot of um, jumping in. So mm-hmm. a lot of my RBTs in the past have seen me jump in, run the session, provide the reinforcement, and then oftentimes have, having to be mindful and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't look like a typical session. I'm running it. What do you want me to do? How can I support you? Would you like me to model for 15 minutes? Step back for a little bit of time. How can we structure this? I've also done a lot of um, emailing. I'm coming in tomorrow. I'll be there three to five. What do you want me to see first? And I want to work with the child. Um, How much time would you like me to spend doing that before I step back? Uh, And then, you know, like you're saying, Carrie, really making sure I'm listening to my RBTs as people who are sometimes juggling school schedules, driving from client to client, managing the parents. What can I do to support you? Is that um, a check-in via email? Should I give you a phone call after a difficult session, you know, um, using Slack or Teams or whatever it is that the organization has structured so that I can be a um, sounding board for you when you're struggling? That's one way that I really think, like you were saying, um, Shannon and Carrie, that we can really step up to offer support for this burnout. And And again, Shannon, like you were saying, RVT burnout and and BCBA burnout, jumping into self-care is very important. Being mindful of what pushes us beyond that that fatigue, but then knowing where are my boundaries that I can provide in the organization that I'm at. Because some of us don't have that control. We are are scheduled. uh, We're told where to go and where to be. And um, this job might be what we need for our supervision hours or for you know, uh, um, just the rent that we need to make. So there is no control over being canceled on driving out to a session where the child gets sick and I'm not paid for that time. So how can I, as um, someone that oversees your cases, works with those families, really support you in making sure that we can get you what you need to be effective? Really great stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of came at it differently because I don't know. I've been in the, I've been working for so long now. (laughs) I just asked myself what the question of how have I been able to keep in jobs as long as I have, because, you know, my, my, I've always had side jobs, but my main salary to job change is about every 15 years, which is a long time for this field. So I just kind of asked myself that question. And I think I came up with a few things one of which is related to what Carrie was talking about, having relationships with people that you trust, whether you, whether that is supervisors, I think it's incredibly important that you do trust your supervisor, but really who you're there with day in and day out are your coworkers. 
And so building a team within that team where you know that you can check out when you need to check out and someone else will be there, or you can just go, you know, mind dump, or you can switch problems, you know, just some sort of camaraderie group has always helped. Um, The other thing is I've always been kind of lucky to work in environments where you could walk away. I think this is a lot harder for the RBTs working one-to-one services, but you know, if I was fed up with some situation working in a residential program or in a school, I could always go, you know, do something in another room or go play with a kid on the playground or go sit and talk with a teacher who, you know, this is her planning period. So being able to switch has been wonderfully helpful, but I know it's not always going to be possible for everyone who works. But I think really the biggest thing for me because I am an, I am guilty of being a grass is always greener kind of person. So I'm always thinking about what I'm going to do next. Mm. <laughs> and so my side jobs have always been me trying out that grass is other greener, grass, grass is greener, other job to just kind of see, is this something that I want to do next for my next 15, 10 to 15 years? Or am I just daydreaming that the world is better somewhere else doing something else and giving me a little bit of a different experience um, just for a few hours a week sometimes has been enough of a break. And you bring that perspective from that other context back to where you are. There's always cross application involved. And then the last thing, I have a, I have a teenage boy. And I'm pretty soon to have a 20 year old and I'm going to have to quit calling him a teenager but, who called me out on something a few, few years ago. Cause I went out to um, dinner with friends and I came back and I said, you know, every time we go out, I, there's this period of time where I have nothing to say because they're talking about all these cool things they do. And all I do is work and I can't even talk about it. And he said, that's right. You need a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So I did. I was thinking about, hey, what did I do? What did I want to do when I was a kid? Um, Did I dream that I would work 70 hours a week and that would be my fun? No, (laughs) probably not. So starting to rediscover who I was and what I needed to do. So Shannon, you and I talked a little bit before and kind of just created an arc for you know, people who are interested in OBM are interested for a variety of different reasons. So uh, I think we wanted to start out by just talking about how a clinician who's working every day, maybe providing some supervisory services, but um, interacting and they're not maybe in a management role and they're not ready to launch completely into an OBM career, but how they can incorporate principles from OBM into their practice to help with some of these things that we've just been talking about, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's good to start a little bit, just maybe not everybody's familiar with what we're talking about when we talk about OBM. So, you know, organizational behavior management is the science of human behavior applied in work settings. Um, A lot of people utilize OBM concepts and principles in their supervision practices, um, but it's really a wider area than that. So there, there's a lot more involved in OBM, um, but there are some very good applications to like supervision and management processes. So the, the best supervisors are using organizational behavior management practices like um, consistent data collection for staff and giving them data-based feedback. Um, I wish more people were objectively collecting data during their supervision processes. And I don't know if you've all seen um, anybody who does this really well or have experiences with folks collecting data during your supervision. So what have you all seen? Good question. I haven't done super supervision in a few years, but um, we would, uh, we had, uh, I would say rubrics for a lack of a better word. Um, and when I say supervision, let me iterate the type because I feel like we can, there's a few different times. Um, this isn't so much for like task list to become a B, uh, BCBA, but more about like case supervision. Um, and we created um, 
various benchmarks uh, with respect to um, fidelity of the treatment plan, uh, preparation for the session, how closely the therapist is, uh, delivers the behavior intervention plan for any unwanted behaviors. Um, did they deviate in a contextually relevant type of setting? Um, you know, did they provide, uh, when we were talking about uh, making programmatic changes, did they offer a suggestion? Was that suggestion relevant to the data? Stuff like this. It was like a 50 question point list thing that we would uh, take data on. Yeah. With it. And sometimes we would even take uh, frequency data uh, with just them and the learner for, you know, like a 10 minute sample looking at their proficiency, uh, looking at the how the learner responds to them. Are they getting smiles and rapport? Are they getting a learner who's a little bit more standoffish and backing away? Does then the instructor change their approach in that in that type of context and setting? Not to mention like how many programs ran, how many reinforcers delivered at the proper time, yada, yada, yada. So um Carrie, how, how did you did you do the all 50 questions every time? Was this, how did you use that? Was yeah. It every I mean, so you know, there was, there's two different tools. One was like that in session documenting what I'm seeing in that 10 minute window. when I'm just letting you run with the kid and the therapist. Cause like we would both pre-plan ahead of time. Like what programs are we going to use for this, uh, the sample, um, and then that other one was more about like at the end of that time I sat with them and we wanted to document because that was our documentation of mm -hmm. indicating that, you know, we did our job in that moment as supervisors. And then, uh, so yeah, we try to do that, you know, a hundred percent of the time. Sometimes that wasn't always possible. Or if you're just like, Hey, I'm just stopping in for, a 15 minute drop in because we're yeah. going to problem solve on this one program. That wasn't the time for that. But um, with respect to insurance companies, let's say there was no programmatic changes. I needed a, to document that I was making sure that the treatment protocol was being followed according to the plan. And so I would, you know, our, our resolution for that is looking at fidelity and providing feedback around the clinician in the therapeutic setting. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, you'd be like, oh, yeah, no, oh, this, this, things, things got to keep on going. This is great, you know. Um, but you can't then just say like, all right, I, I just sat here for 30 minutes and now pay me insurance company, you know, like you have to document that you're doing something, you're being active. And so with that came our, our feedback around uh, the behaviors that we were looking to see in that session. And so then we would um, send a copy of the form to the clinician so they could look at that. And then we scheduled a time, you know, our regular sessions to then review the various uh, data and, and see if they had any questions around that. Nice. And it sounds like there were a lot of different measurement tools involved in that. Yeah. And one thing that OBM practitioners specialize in is developing out those measurement tools and processes. Because you mentioned frequency data, which would require good operational definitions or what we would call pinpoints. points. Um, there would also be, you mentioned rubrics or what we would usually refer to as behaviorally anchored rating scales. Um, it's basically a, a glorified rubric. Um, yeah, and I don't think supervisors are getting enough um, education and training in how to actually develop those tools. We know as supervisors, whether we're supervising cases, whether we're supervising um, individuals towards certification, whether we're supervising folks who are maintaining certifications, mm -hmm. uh, we're not given enough education and training on, well, how do I develop out a behaviorally anchored rating scale? How do I determine exactly what to measure? Do I sample measure or do I collect data on literally everything that my staff is doing? And that's one of the things that I'm noticing in the field in general is um, we, we aren't trained sufficiently enough on developing supervision assessment tools. Um, so I'm curious if anybody's seen any good assessment tools. 
being used in, in a supervision process. So secret word number one, tools. In my past, um, and this was early on, so I would say in the, in 2006, uh, when I was working with Dr. Partington back in the clinic, uh, I was also working with Dr. Pamela Osnes, and she and um, Trevor Stokes had developed something called the SCOOP. So it's a systematic carousel of observation um, of performance. And we would take, we, we would call it scooping. So we made it a verb okay. and we would scoop all of our, um, people would scoop us and we would scoop them and we would scoop teachers. And then as I moved through my career, I started to scoop my RBTs. And what we would do is sit with them for a 15 minute kind of review of here's what scoop is. Here are the behaviors I'm looking. So every, it was a 10 minute time sample within periods of sessions that you would identify going in for um, observation. We wouldn't call it supervision back then. And what we were looking for was a string of coded behaviors that had a ratio of four to one in terms of specific praise to general praise, in addition to very clear codes of how frequently um, learning opportunities should be presented. And they were all coded in the three-term contingency. So instruction, compliance, and praise, or instruction, compliance, specific praise. Uh, But it was a very nice system of here is what, when I'm presenting a 10-minute scoop and you're watching me, this is what the session should look like. So we trained RBTs to scoop me working with the child, take a little break. We'd talk it through if the child was able to engage in independent activity. And then I would scoop the staff. And what that really did for RBTs was make it less aversive to have a supervisor come in. Hey, Mm -hmm. I'm scoring your behavior. I know exactly what you're looking for. And then you get to score me. Um, And then what it also provided was a nice ratio of performance. So you would go and calculate all of the observed kind of three-term contingency behavior and the specific versus general praise and say, I saw 10% general praise to your 90% specific. That's fantastic. Or vice versa. And I'd like you to flip that. Um, It's been years since I've used it, but I used it early on and then later in my clinical work. And it really took away that component of, oh my gosh, my supervisor's coming in and I don't know what they're looking for. And I'm really uncomfortable Um, and made it a very objective and measurable session. In addition to, for me as a very young supervisor growing through my career saying, what am I looking for when I get here? Okay, I'm looking for instruction. I'm looking for feedback. I'm looking for, um, there were some codes like affection and where you could take tickles and say, that child really isn't enjoying that affection or that didn't work. You did it and the child eloped. Um, Mm -hmm. So it really gave you a 10 minute clear sample of what you were watching and then very objective, objective measures for the next time you went in. So I loved it. It's, I think it was um, published in the late 80s, and then we used it in the early 2000s. Um, I don't know how much it's being used now, and I don't know if other systems have been developed since then that are more robust. But for my experience, that was really helpful. I love that you made it a verb. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and the language to talk around it, like, is not, that's not a threatening word. I mean, like... Mm-hmm like as it presents right now, right? Yeah. It doesn't seem threatening. Hey, I'm going to scoop you up today. Like, you know, it <laughs> also kind of like makes me think it's like, oh, like a hug. You could just, yeah. you know, like and you can couch this feedback and, you know, especially when it's focusing on specific praise and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure that there was an element there. We had this in ours of like, there could be 10 things for you to intervene on, mm-hmm. uh, but we're not going to talk about all those 10 things. You're going to pick two exactly. and then get those right talk about all this goodness over here you need to have at least like you know a double ratio of good things to talk about and address in comparison to what needs to be intervened on or the, the corrective feedback but i don't know i love i love that you turned it into a verb i think that yeah just- and it was fun to, when my rbts would email and say hey can you scoop me on friday mm-hmm. it was like I, i'm gonna come and scoop you yeah. Well, the fact that they're asking for it is brilliant because typically, you know, formal evaluation, which is what we call when you're actually going to collect data, um, is formal formal observations of performance. That's such an aversive thing based upon, you know, individual learning histories around if my supervisor's coming in to collect data, something bad is going to happen. They're not mm-hmm. typically because we're not giving sufficient, you know, positive, you know, feedback. Um, Folks have have associated with that with, you know, um, potentially aversive contingencies to come. So the fact that you've created kind of a positive culture around it, and that's really what it is, is 
I'm not exempt from it as a leader in the organization. You're going to be evaluating me too. And I'll get to evaluate you yeah. and good things happen when these evaluations happen. I think that's just brilliant. Shaden, you brought up a really good point there is that this isn't a unidirect unidirectional yeah. way, right? It's not top down. Mm-hmm. So it should be them evaluate, like uh, people evaluating up. And I think people evaluating cross, like side to side, Absolutely. right? So your team members, there's mm-hmm. um, times when we first started doing evaluation uh, before, I mean, you know, baby steps, right? You got to start with one and then you got to add, but um, even, you know, team members would notice they're like, they do this with you because you're here. They don't necessarily do this when it's, you know, and thinking about like the, the kind of the slack that other team members may, may have to like um, pitch in and help out with because, you know, one team member is, is dropping the ball for a particular reason. And that goes unnoticed because sometimes at a supervisory level, you're like, oh, great, this stuff is getting done. And, and but then it's overlooked that, well, yeah, that's because their shift keeps on having to get covered or they didn't yeah. chart the data from their session. So the person who follows them mm-hmm. afterwards is they have now have to go in with, and have to chart all of their data as well as the data that they're responsible for. Like things like this sometimes um, go unnoticed. So having that type of um, performance evaluation include team members as well as performance evaluation of your supervisor is I think so important. Well, and that's stepping in to take into account the systems. Mm -hmm. So the performer's not struggling because the performer doesn't want to do a good job. That is never the case. Yeah. You know, it is probably a systemic issue. It sounds like that was a process issue of the person before you didn't do their step. Mm -hmm. Therefore it all falls on you as an individual. So intervening on that one individual, that one performer is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, on the topic of like troubleshooting and figuring out why folks maybe aren't doing as good as they possibly could. um, We need to take a functional assessment approach, just like we do with clients to figure out what are the environmental variables here that are, you know, potentially contributing to this person struggling. And the the go-to tool in the field right now is the performance diagnostic checklist or the PDC. Um, but there's other tools like um, the consequence analysis or picnic analysis from, from Aubrey Daniels. Um, so both of those tools are just taking a step back to say, okay, we're not blaming the performer because we don't blame our clients. We should not blame our staff either. They're responding to their environments. And could it be an equipment issue? Could there be a process disconnect? Did we not train them sufficiently enough? Are there no consequences, positive or otherwise? Yeah. Is there insufficient feedback? And I just wanted to kind of orient to that's another place where OBM can make huge contributions to supervision is, you know, don't don't make assumptions about why people might maybe are struggling to perform and use a functional assessment tool like we do clinically. And can I put a plug in too for sometimes it even needs maybe it's even broader than that. And when Nissa brought up her scoop tool from the 80s, you know, one of my jobs in the past that I really liked doing the most was being called in to troubleshoot why um, behavior plans weren't working in residential and school services. So looking for, we've done the functional assessment, we're implementing it, we think we're doing it right, behavior's not coming down, the challenging behavior's not coming down, can you come give us a second opinion? And over and over and over again, it, it ended up being a lot of different things as systems are. And we're talking about really challenging behaviors. So severe self-injury and aggression usually were the things that we were being called in for. And we expanded into what I was taught in special education was called ecological assessment. Mm -hmm. And so taking that data on things that are probably on your scoop checklist, Nissa, I don't know, (laughs) but to see, we would do round robins for what every staff member in the uh, context was doing at any given time and what all of the the students or clients, whatever um, group we had, were also doing. 
so that we could show those relationships. Whereas this person's behavior plan is very intense, but if there's only one staff member and there are six people here and they have three folks going that have this intensive reinforcement programming, and the supervisor from down the hill comes in and wants to spend 20 minutes talking about the process for ordering and discontinuing mop heads. <laughs> we actually have the data to show where their their attention is drawn and all of these other kind of contextual things like sometimes safety issues even. So we're being we're asking them to observe, to intervene, to document, to call on a safety protocol. And uh, they have to write down all the times that everything is going on, but we won't let them use their phones. And it's dark because it's 2 a.m. and we're in someone's bedroom. So being able to uncover lots of things that, as you were saying, Shannon, it's usually not the staff member's fault that they're not implementing this plan. It is usually that we have constructed an environment that makes it somehow unsupportive or, or challenging and lots of barriers that no one even knows exist. Exactly. There was a meme that I saw going around that said, you want to you want to see a behavior analyst be mentalistic? Have them explain behavior in an organizational setting. Do you know what I'm talking about, Shannon? Do you, did you see that one? Because that's where so often, like, we're like, we don't blame the learner. We don't blame the learner in a clinical setting when we have, when we're working with our clients. But the minute that someone underperforms, mm -hmm. that it's our staff, mm -hmm. it is them. Oh, they're lazy. They don't have a good work ethic. They, um, it's the millennials, you know, who I don't think like, it was just funny because you know, I think I'm like, I'm on the cusp. I'm a 19 and 8 plus baby. So I feel like depending on whatever survey on BuzzFeed I fill out, I could be a millennial. I could be like, there's like three generations that I'm a part of apparently. But um, I see that so often. And Shannon, you, uh, you probably have... There is one that may, I think of, but there's this is a topic that recurs often on social media where it's a business owner who is talking about staff not doing what they want them to do or staff asking for for more than apparently what they're offered. They want they want supervision. Am I supposed to pay them for supervision? They want benefits. Am I supposed to pay them for benefits? And there was like this huge thing. I am trying to get better about social media and not getting involved in conversations. I did have to say one thing, but <laughs> but it's it's a when reading that thread, it still seems as if we are not only being incredibly mentalistic and blaming the learner, but we're also not necessarily using our tools to evaluate performance that allows us to be compassionate mm -hmm. and then also take a perspective of these are like highly valued, highly talented employees that are working with sensitive populations and, sh and their talent should be coveted as opposed to being like, well, if you don't like how this is, there's the door, you know? Uh, I don't know. What is your take on how people approach to setting up like benefits and systems um, with all that in their organization and, and valuing the employee that way? Secret word number two, systems. Well, and one interesting note on the quote, uh, Dr. Linda LeBlanc actually said that at FABA in 2017. I remember okay. it. Okay. Okay. So wow. He said the number one way you can turn a behavior analyst into a mentalist is to ask them about their employees' behavior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in getting back to this, this whole idea of you know we we focus so much. So BF Skinner, two primary things: least restrictive procedures and positive reinforcement. That's the core of behavior analytic practices. However, what do we do with staff behavior? Well, we're going to policy them to death. Oh, God. So we're going to use a bunch of antecedent interventions that nobody looks at that are not salient. It doesn't really fall into good behavior analytic practice, but I digress. And then we're going to utilize aversive control and threats and non-compete agreements that force you to stay in an organization that you don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the quality of services when you hold somebody at a company that they don't want to be in? Um, your, your most beautiful behavior plan is nothing 
if your staff don't implement it appropriately and aren't motivated to implement it appropriately when you're not in the environment. And all that aversive control does is require the threat to be there constantly to get performance. So, you know, and the only way that we can do that is to shift from this whole aversive control, negative reinforcement, you know, paradigm that we're in and shift it over to positive, Mm -hmm. you know, encouraging people and providing lots of good positive feedback and letting them know that they're important and not like, if you don't like it, you can leave. Because right now in this job market, people they, will. Leave they can leave. <laughs> they will fail. And I have very little sympathy for folks who are like, I don't understand why my folks are leaving. When two weeks ago, you were trying to get out of paying for unrestricted, you know, supervision tasks. I don't, I don't sympathize with you. I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. I've got two competing thoughts on this. Mm-hmm. One is <clears throat> Carrie was talking about how we use <clears throat> non-behavior and analytics stuff to to <laughs> combat burnout and just be a human, right? So mine is I've been streaming the Office Ladies podcast. So if you are a fan of the Office, <laughs> uh, I mean it's just been a life. So is it me. the female actresses from the Office yeah. have a pod- oh? I'm going to check that out. Okay. And Angela Kinsey, oh. who um, played Pam and Angela. Yeah. And they're best friends. And so they're, they're rewatching and they're rehashing and they're oh, interviewing wow. people. Awesome. All of this to say, everything comes back to behavior analysis always. So <laughs> they brought person after person after person has come on and really praised the environment that Greg Daniels created on the, cre- oh. on the, on the set of that show, which was you have a good idea, let's use it and let's credit you for that good idea. You um, want to try something, go ahead and try that. If it doesn't work, I'll tell you it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And But you have tried and you have learned and you have grown. You want to go work somewhere else for a little while and try that out and see if you can get a bigger job or a bigger role or bigger profile. You go and do that. We will write around you. And if you want to come back, good. You can always come back. This is always coming. And I just think that that is such a model for what you were just saying, Shannon. I mean, you, it doesn't take always behavior analysis training to understand how to create conditions that people want to be in. It helps, <laughs> but well, sometimes we, we, we just know the mechanisms. We know yeah. why it works, but you don't have to know why it works to see that it works to create a positive work environment that people want to be a part of rather than are being held hostage by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I use the office in so many, so many examples, good, bad, or indifferent um, for organizational behavior management, where they figured out, you know, all of the different contingencies at play, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's good to hear that it was a good, good working environment. The reality of it rather than what they're showing. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Shannon, do you, it's possible for a small business owner to create those kinds of conditions? I would argue it's easier for a small business owner to put in the systems and the processes necessary to have good OBM practices within their organization. Um, When you have, say, an organization of 2,000 people, and I've worked with organizations with 2,000 staff members, the struggle of getting everybody behind a system that's going to work getting every leader trained up in the delivery of positive reinforcement, changing all of the legalese that lawyers have thrown into the handbooks and things like that. You're, you're, you're going to struggle all the way up the hill. I primarily work with small to mid-size organizations. My smallest has like three employees and the, you know, usually there's about 30. It's so beautiful to be able to put in those systems and processes of, you know, performance-based pay, You know, you do a good job at your job. You not only get a base pay, but you get bonuses that reflect how good of a job you're doing. Um, Much easier to put in in a company of 30 people than a company of 300 people. Um, So I would argue that those folks are in the perfect position to put in really good reinforcement systems for staff. Um, So, yeah, that would be my thought. seems like one of the things that you probably encounter often the hardest thing, and it's harder for larger organizations because it's just based on their size, is the changing hearts and minds, right? So having people buy into this new way of doing things, because it may require them to do a little extra work, but then having them come into contact with the contingencies of 
but this is why we do them and this is how it makes it better. Um, some people can, I'm sure, instantly, like, I heard the pitch. I totally believe it. Yes, let's do this. And some people are like, no, I've been doing it this way for 15 years. I'm still going to keep on doing it this way. Or better yet, I walked in the snow for 12 miles and the facing uh. alligators with no shoes on. You you should you should do the same because if not, you will not learn and you will not be as, as good as I am. So I feel like the hardest, probably the first thing that you encounter, not only even the logistics, is just like the buy-in. Well, and it necessitates leaders changing their behavior. Mm -hmm. When I'm typically called into an organization, they're like, oh my gosh, my staff members are doing X, Y, and Z. And some of them don't appreciate when I say, well, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> because your behavior is what produces, the environments that you've set up is what produces your staff member's behavior. So if you're getting people, you know, spreading, you know, gossip and rumors, it's being reinforced. If the behavior is happening, it is. Yeah. And that's typically where folks will be like, I don't know about this OBM thing. I don't know that I like. It. I'm like oh. I changed my behavior. Ugh. <laughs> I just wanted you to come in and fix my staff. Not unlike in clinical cases when, you know, maybe caregivers are stressed out and don't really want to be involved and they just want you to kind of take the kid and run with the procedure. It's the same thing here where I'm like, hey, you're going to have to change your, you know, communication behaviors, you're going to have to, you know, switch up the way that you're doing things and how you're re providing reinforcement for staff. Most folks don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. So the folks that I work with that continue to work with me are the ones that are truly changing the entire face of, you know, this, the, the clinical ABA space, because they're now setting a new standard that we shouldn't just accept the stuff that's been happening for years on years on years, and especially folks who have contacted a lot of reinforcement for setting up, say, a 2,000 person business. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew my company to 2,000 people. I shouldn't have to change what I'm doing. Look at what Steve Jobs did. Right. Well, that didn't mean he was engaging in good leadership behavior. He was a jerk. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very complicated. But leaders, those who are, are listening, should reflect on, you know, maybe I am playing, not maybe, you are playing a role in the behavior that you're seeing in your staff. So that means that you've got to step back and figure out, well, how do I change my behavior to change staff behavior? Shannon, is there any difficulty in integrating the OBM recommendations with human resources departments and rules and regulations? And mm. that's so as an OBM practitioner, I do have to learn about HR. I'm, I'm working on sitting for my uh, PHR or my APHR certification because we do, we, we dabble in that side of things where we have to be like, okay, we want to do this, you know, bonus system. Is that going to come back on us related to taxes or the staff member going to, so, you know, having to navigate those things. My, my least favorite is the uh, progressive disciplinary policies. Yeah. So most states require you to utilize progressive discipline, which means you get a, you know, a off the record warning, you get a verbal warning, you get a written warning, you get a second written warning, then you get, you know, an unpaid day off. And now, so we know from, you know, behavior analytic concepts and principles that we probably shouldn't be fading in punishment procedures. Yeah. Um, that isn't how that works. However, from a legal perspective, we have to have those types of things in place, but we can put those things in place and create them also utilizing, you know, what we know of organizational behavior management to make them better adapted to still meet the law associated with HR, but also be conceptually systematic with behavior analytic literature. So yeah, we, we have to play nice, just like you all have to play nice with SLPs and OTs. Mm -hmm. I got to play nice with the HR folks. I got to play nice with IO psychologists. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really good question. I actually want to jump on that question. In my last role, um, my supervisor back then and the HR team, we called it a, a clinical HR marriage. So I was um, a director of clinical services and I worked, I'd say I had three weekly meetings with the entire HR team just for check-ins. How's it going? What's the bonus program look like? Um, we didn't struggle because the HR team was so fantastic, but as we would move through performance feedback, evaluations, we did reach some barriers in terms of, hey, our feedback is consistent daily, if not weekly. Um, we can't wait six months to provide this full checklist that you're asking us to, mm -hmm. we need to do it frequently. 
So what systems can we use? Um, so we bring in different HR, you know, management systems, different checklists you can do on your iPad or your phone. And then we'd have to build in the antecedent strategy of your supervisor. Here's the frequency. Here's how frequently I'll be checking in to see that you've conducted this assessment. Um, but here's the deadline. And if you meet this deadline, you'll earn this bonus for doing such. If you do it before the deadline, you'll earn an even better bonus. Um, and then if you miss the deadline, we give you a couple feedbacks and then check in to say, do I need to come do this with you? What, what are the barriers to conducting these, um, you know, these metrics on your staff? And I think a lot of times it was um, staff turnover. So as I was set to go and conduct this uh, annual review, monthly review, whatever it may be, but now that staff is gone. So now I have to do the whole process again for a new staff member. So I think, you know, while we as behavior analysts don't know a lot about HR, as organizations grow, HR is a part of every piece of, mm -hmm. of ABA organizations. And, and Shannon, I give you kudos for moving in that direction of learning. Because there were times when I would be in these HR meetings thinking, I need to understand more about mm -hmm. our law here in this state and their ability to have, you know, um, this feedback. And like, I, I was very, I didn't love these warnings. You know, why couldn't we just give one warning and then provide this process and support? Um, and I didn't know that there were state laws that required the, you know, the pre-warning with the verbal warning with the written warning. Um, it just felt like too many opportunities for someone to fail before mm -hmm. we could actually help them. Exactly. So can you give us kind of a, a, a salient example of how you, of something that you could do that embeds within that? Well, and I wanted to speak to, and I'll, I'll give an example with the, the idea of needing an annual review. Mm -hmm. So we've got a system, we have to do annual reviews. Very rarely are, are your HR departments not going to continue to want that to occur. So what we end up doing in order to kind of make them happy while we're getting what we need is that we're collecting data at a minimum on a monthly basis, hopefully on a weekly basis. And then in those six month reviews, in those annual re reviews, we look at the graphs. Mm -hmm. We look at the, the, the data that we've been collecting over time rather than, well, now we've got to do this 50 item checklist once a year. It's like, no, we've done a 10 item checklist for the last five months. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to look at all the data together. And they, you don't want the staff members to be surprised at anything they get in an annual review if you're going to use annual reviews and i don't like annual reviews but they should already have heard all the feedback that they're going to get they should already know where their data stands and remember if we're doing behavior analysis we better be graphing the data mm -hmm. so that's not any different for staff behavior so that's just a compromise of okay we'll give you your annual reviews but what that annual review looks like is going to be shaped by more frequent data collection. We would never collect data on staff behavior once a, or a client behavior once a year. Right. That would be entirely right. unacceptable. So why are we doing that with staff and saying, okay, you get one chance one time this year, hopefully you do well. Um, and that also leads to some of the resistance to being monitored that we talked about right. earlier of, I've only got this one chance to do really good. And if I mess up today, you know, this is on my annual review. Um, whereas if you're collecting data weekly or, you know, more frequently than that, they've got plenty of opportunities to get that feedback, change what they're doing and have it be a positive experience rather than the end, this annual review is going to sink me for the rest of the, for the rest of the year. So that's just one example of taking like an HR structure and saying, okay, well, where does the behavior analysis fit in the HR structure? And in that example, what I'm hearing is a lot of like, uh, different levels of data, right? So uh, mm -hmm. weekly, I can be taking micro level data. I can, when we mean monthly, I can have meso level data. And then like my annual review, you know, all of those things kind of wrap up either if it's more cumulative scores or maybe things that happen less frequently, but these are more of my macro level uh, data analyses, mm -hmm. right? And so you're right, all of these little check-ins um, or, different types of data, the micro and the meso, let me know that, uh, okay, how am I doing on the path to this macro level data that's going to be collected annually? 
um, mm-hmm. we can we can think about it. Like, I just love how you keep on bringing it back. And it's just like, like working with a kid, right? But it's just in a completely different context. We do that with, with regards to our program evaluations and case setups for our learners. We have daily data that we collect with them on targets. We should, uh, my talk at APBA is about this, we should have some meta level che- measures about mm-hmm. programs that are higher level that you have not yet intervened on, but you want to see growth. Yeah. And then your macro level is that assessment that's conducted every six months or the violin like a year, right? That then you should not be surprised with how those data show up, right? You should know exactly how to, because you have all of these sub assessments that inform you for that larger assessment. But you're right. It's, it's funny when behavior analysts go into uh, organizations that are run by formal HR companies and you're like an annual review. Okay. <laughs> and then, so you're like on the side, all right, team, we're going to, we're going to, we're, we're going to do that, but we're also going to create some other things around this. <laughs> yeah. We have to compromise and play nice. That's yeah. For sure. What do we do though, if the, the employee on those macro level assessments is fully functioning? Do we just continue to collect data to show that they continue to maintain those skills? Do we try to help them with the professional development plan to move them beyond there, even though we might not want them to ever move beyond there. We want them to stay in this job that they mm-hmm. do so well. But I'm what sure that there's like, there's goals, right? It's yeah. not always going to be like this same, these same goals are going to be your plan for this year. I mean, Shannon, please elaborate, but I would expect you, you make them harder. What are things that new projects that you're working on or how to advance your career or things like that? So that's how you set up your more higher level. Measures. I think it's, yeah, I think that my question comes from working for state government versus working for corporate America versus versus working for a nonprofit. Whereas in state government, each job comes with elements mm-hmm. and the rating system is for those elements. And it's a it's a score between one and five. So if you've been in doing that job and the five isn't that you it just means that you are functioning um above and beyond what most people who do that job are doing. So if you're already at five on all of your elements, <laughs> what are you supposed to do then? Right? Because there's no professional development goals and things like that we do in other places. So just curious how, what OBM might do if they are stepping in and consulting and such a thing. Well, and I definitely put on my lemon face over here when you were talking about like the Likert style ratings. I'm like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one, I would never have a system that's on a scale of one to five. How do you feel this person is doing X? That is way too open for interpretation. And what's a three to me might be a five to Nissa, might be a, you know, two to uh, Carrie. So um, I would just stay away from those types of systems and maybe lean more on those behaviorally anchored rating scales. Now, more to the point of, all right, so you've got somebody who maybe is legitimately mastering like all of the targets for their work Mm -hmm. there's this is where we have to kind of tread lightly because let's say it's a technician say we're at the technician level the technician perfect scores do we encourage them to move into a bcba role where they might not perform as well so we take a great technician force them into a master's program then get potentially an okay BCBA and we replace that technician with an okay technician. And what we basically did was we pulled down the average performance of the organization because we haven't created any um, growth to any other direction other than, well, if you're a good tech, you have to move into a BCBA role. And I believe it was in the book Radical Candor. She talks about rock stars and superstars. And I always use the same little hand signs. <laughs> so your rock stars are those technicians who are awesome technicians, just the best technicians. And they don't want to move up into the next role. They just want to hang out here. Well, we need to develop reinforcement systems for them. We need to maybe give them opportunities within that role to do new things. So maybe they could become a subject matter expert and you pay for a little extra continuing education for them to develop in, you know, getting really good at working with this particular type of student or on this particular set of targets. Then you've got your superstars and your superstars are easy. 
and more promotions, more, you know, growth within the role. They're the ones who want to become the BCBAs. In our field, we forget about the rock stars and we pressure the rock stars into go get a bunch more student debt so that I can have another BCBA on my team. Um, and then again, pull the whole average performance of the, of the organization down. So we just need to build in more opportunities without forcing people to go back for additional education. So um, in my practice, we work on things called pipelines. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is an adapted version of the leadership pipeline by uh, Sharon, Drotter, and Noel, where they said, you know, as you move through, through your role, even within a role, the expectations change. So I talked to folks about, well, what do we expect from a technician at 90 days versus a year versus three years versus five years? Tell me what those skills are so that we can build assessments in that show their trajectory through this pipeline. And each level has new reinforcers that they get access to. Um, but I do think that one thing that we hit often is given that we are under the, per, well, we are under insurance companies so much, there's only so much that we can do as far as um, pay raises. Mm. However, we can integrate things like additional professional development, additional uh, opportunities for them to shadow other people and cross train. There's, you know, pay for them to go to a conference, like those types of things you can build in so that even though you're kind of held down a little bit by reimbursement rates, they're still finding things that you're, you're providing them at those different levels of performance reinforcing. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I awesome. love that. I love mm -hmm. it. I, again, in my last life, that was something I worked on. we um, within an organization. How do we support growth? We had RBTs who clearly, I mean, no matter what they wanted to be BCBAs, we wanted to support them, offer hours, created a nice, um, apprenticeship kind of model. And then we had the ones who were the rock stars who they loved what they did, but they had no desire. They might have talked about going to be an OT or an SLP. And I know as a behavior analyst, sometimes you're like, okay, I mean, this is going to be great for you to use in your practice because now you've known what it's like to sit in the hot seat and you're going to take it into your OT or SLP practice. Um, mm -hmm. But what is your trajectory? And then we even had uh, a pathway, we called it career pathways for those mm -hmm. RBTs who probably didn't want to go back to school, but maybe wanted to move into operations or scheduling because they understand how difficult that task is. And, you know, you've got to call parents and reschedule and they've got those soft skills because they've been in the field for a period of time. So I think, and then going to what you're saying, Shannon, about the, the limitations to being able to offer pathways dependent on your organization size, the funding that you have, the ability to support staff kind of climbing the ladder. Mm -hmm. um, is all really important to what the organization can provide and develop in terms of a checklist to moving into those roles. But I think um, back to your point, Shannon Hill, um, really talking to those staff and saying, what exactly, you know, you've been doing fantastic here. I love watching you with the kiddos. The parents love you. You are so requested, um, especially in, within an ABA clinic role. What are your goals? How can we support you? If that's supporting you to move beyond us one day, we want to do that. Or if that's supporting you to stay within the organization and then become a BCBA, that's another direction. I think those are um, conversations. And then going back full circle, like Carrie was saying, when you get to know the people that you work with and supervise, you have an idea of where they want to land in the next two, three to five years of their career. Yeah. And I think and along something that Shannon may have been kind of going for too, is that sometimes the reinforcers are in place already for them. And that is why they are already being so um, successful. And it doesn't necessarily always mean that we have to add to that. It may just be that we don't, we need to make sure that they continue to get access to those reinforcers, whatever they may be. And yet like, they still develop their career path. So it's like, it's like you, yeah. you love working with like, cause there are people, my husband's one of them. He's like, I want to be a BCBA. That means like, like report writing and like doing this and then like no but so he's he's our trainer but so that means he still gets tons of contact with the learners he you know he's focused on rbt development and stuff like that so it's still like or or people who are who maybe don't even want that level they they are just like i love working with the kids or i love working with clients stuff like that because they see that meaningful change that's what keeps them going and yet Anyone who's in the same career 
for, I mean, Shannon, like you said, 15 years. And then that, that role doesn't change. Even if their reinforcers are working with their client, you, you still want some sort of pipeline, Shannon, like as you beautifully described. So it's like, I, I think it, granted, like you mentioned, we're so dependent on insurance companies with 70% of our field. Mm-hmm. Um, it will be interesting to see if we are able to carve out a career for an RBT. Because right now, you know, even even if the RBTs are working full time, um, it seems as if it, the longevity in that position is short. Uh, so, so carving out a career that says you want to you want this position you love in it great but here is how we can grow in advance and um and you can still be in that position but here are some new things that you can take on that are reinforcing to you that are still within this uh that credentials uh purview and and things like that i think i think it would be nice to see us kind of not not looking at the rbt as a part-time job or a summer job or a while you're in college job, but, at, but like as a, as a respectful job in of itself. Yeah. You know, 20 years ago, um, direct care staff for, um, people working with, with folks who have intellectual disabilities for the most part went through that exact same thing. And so they started creating a credentialing system and a specialist system. They changed the name because it was always called um, like house mother or um, coordinator or, you know, I I forget what we were called in the very beginning when I was hired. What was I called? I can't remember. Um, DCW, direct care worker. Okay. So they changed that title to direct support professional and started embedding in every way the language to show that this is a profession and this is a mm-hmm. career and giving them community college courses that were not only that initial onboarding training, but continuing to develop that expertise and to give them that specialization if they wanted to specialize in autism or if they wanted to specialize in severe problem behavior or mm-hmm. people who have feeding needs or whatever. So I think there's a path that we could duplicate to a certain degree with what you're talking about, Keely. Yeah. With RBTs. That's awesome. Yeah. So I do want to save some time. We're coming close to the end of our, our recording that we have asked her, asked Shannon to stay, stick around for. Mm-hmm. Um, what about BCBAs who are interested in maybe learning more about OBM or becoming an OBM specialist? What are your recommendations for switching that career path over? Yeah, so so just a, a disclaimer here to kind of go with our conversation. You know, uh, when Carrie was mentioning, you know, where where your reinforcers are as a practitioner, um, if you love working with the kids or you know the the clients, whoever it may be that you're working with, being a business owner or being an OBM practitioner is not the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially, and I think folks will like move into like a business owner kind of role and say, oh, well, I'm doing this because I love working with these clients. However, you are eliminating that as a potential reinforcer to keep you going on a regular basis because right. you are no longer working with the clients. You are dealing with time off and you're dealing with HR and you're dealing with insurance companies and all of that stuff. So I, I wanted to just bring that in here too, as we start to talk about, you know, folks who are feeling burnt out often see OBM as like the go-to, like, this is a potential way that I can still use the stuff that I enjoy and move into a different career. Now, while we're able to speak the same language, the practice of OBM is very different than the practice of, you know, clinical behavior analysis. We have completely different sets of tools different competencies. Um, It is a generalization because, you know, the science of human behavior applies to everybody. Um, However, I want folks before even having this conversation to be mindful of scope of competence. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our ethical code is we need to receive 
education, oversight, and individually practice to be considered competent in any space. So we don't see people going into to working with feeding disorders without going through sufficient continuing education and um, doing doing some coursework in that, you know, to be considered competent. People seem to perceive the OBM space as like, well, I'm a BCBA and a business owner, therefore I'm doing OBM, or I'm a BCBA and a supervisor, therefore I'm doing OBM. But OBM is actually a, a pretty intense specialty. So we have different textbooks, we've got different you know, processes and procedures. So for those who are interested in developing that scope of competence, now that I've gotten that off my chest, um, the first place is always starting with education and training. So there are a number of organizations and individuals who do provide coursework in organizational behavior management and performance management, um, which is a sub-discipline within uh, OBM. So I provide some courses on that. Um, Aubrey Daniels International provides courses on that. There is no certification for organizational behavior management. So there is no governing body for OBM practitioners. Um, so a lot of folks who are interested or constantly looking for like, where's the credential? There isn't one. It's pretty, it's pretty unregulated. So you're going to get that education and training. Um, there's, I think a couple of master's programs in it. I received mine on campus. So I do actually have a master's in organizational behavior management. I was very fortunate to get that opportunity. Um, so that education piece, taking courses, reading books, um, Aubrey Daniels performance management book, is a must read if you're going to get into OBM. Um, uh, Dr. Maria Malat's Paradox of Organizational Change, um, OBM The Essentials from Pritchard and Wine um, are all really good texts to start kind of, if you have to do self-education rather than taking like a master's course, those are kind of the go-to textbooks. Okay. Then okay. thinking forward into, well, I got the book learning. Now let's move into something like um, mentorship because you're not supposed to go practice in another area of ABA without appropriate oversight. Um, that's usually where people get kind of stuck because there are very few OBM practitioners who provide a lot of mentorship and coaching for new practitioners. We're very busy um, and there aren't a lot of us, especially within the BCBA space. So there's um, people don't get certified as behavior analysts when you're an OBM practitioner, there's, it's a, it's a clinical based test. So a lot of them don't sit for it. Yeah. So in finding those folks, you might reach out in what we call the OBM network. So the OBM network is a special interest group of ABAI that is dedicated to OBM. Um, we're actually celebrating our 40th anniversary this year um, and we're launching. Yeah. And we're, I was not around for the whole thing. Um, <laughs> But we're launching a new platform to allow folks to more easily seek out mentorship and coaching. Um, so we'll be launching that soon. Um, so that's going to be another strategy for, you know, figuring out where you can get mentorship. And then it's just going out and practicing with some oversight and some supports. Um, that is what all practitioners should do, no matter what area of ABA they're trying to expand out into. And OBM is no exception. And I think folks perceive OBM as lower risk compared to clinical practice. So they're like, well, I don't really need competence. I can just play around and see what happens. Um, there are businesses that have been shut down because of bad organizational nice. practices. Um, I, I talked to somebody, um, one thing I specialize in is performance scorecarding. And I talked to a, a, a company out West and they said, yeah, we put in a scorecard system and all of our staff threatened to quit or the supervisor specifically all threatened to quit because of the system that was put in place. And I'm like, well, that's the definition of OBM potentially tanking a company because you maybe don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so just to encourage folks, establish scope of competence before anything else. Um, it's that education of, training. Yeah. It's honestly kind of surprising that there's not a certification and, and, and all of that considering, you know, that this is a systems based approach. Is there movement towards establishing OBM as um, having its own regulatory body with ethics codes and certifications and all of that? So I want to parallel it over to behavior analysis in general. With mm -hmm. the development of the certification, 
we became pigeonholed in whatever that certification co covered, which was services primarily to individuals with developmental disabilities or in schools. Um, so OBM got left behind, uh, consumer behavior analysis got left behind, systems got left behind because a certifying body can only regulate practices to the extent that their, their examinations and things cover. Mm -hmm. So the, the OBM space is incredibly broad. For people who don't know, within OBM, you've got performance management, you've got training and development, you've got behavior-based safety, you've got consumer behavior analysis, you've got leadership development. Like it's such a rich and beautiful space. And a lot of our fear is that if we take it and we put a test to it, Am I going to be tested on behavioral safety? Am I going to be tested on behavioral systems analysis? Am I also going to be tested on consumer behavior? So you don't, like, I wouldn't mind a certification in performance management because that's an individual area that can be isolated into an exam. So if they had like sub-discipline exams, maybe, but a certification in OBM would just distill it down into primarily performance management, which is what most OBM programs cover is one performer, ABC, you're done. Um, but there's so many other beautiful areas that just get drowned out when you put a certification on it. So that's at least where I stand. And I'm not speaking for the OBM network or anybody any anybody else I'm associated with. Um, that's just how I feel about that, that certif certification concept in OBM. Now, Shannon, you, you do have a BCBA credential, don't you? What that I do. And so why, and you know, you've done a great job explaining the test and how it, there's not really, you know, it doesn't cover OBM things. And so, mm -hmm. but why did you seek out a credential and why maybe others would also? So mine is a very special situation. I got into a PhD program in behavior analysis and they required it. Mm -hmm. Ta -da. Ta -da. So <laughs> but you mean I, I know as a I, mean, I know some who have, who've like been like eh. well there is an incentive to maintain it i also work with human service organizations mm -hmm. so it gives me a little bit of street cred of mm -hmm. yeah i can work with your company because i also know what this role is and the people that i'm helping create systems for i had no intention of getting certified um when I got into the PhD program, they said, this is required. You have to be able to certify people at the autism clinic on campus. Um, so I had to get it. And I, you know, put it off for an extra year after graduation because I didn't want it. That wasn't what my intention was. And I didn't need it. I was already practicing. Right. So, yeah, I'm kind of a special case. But if you're planning on operating within human service companies, it does demonstrate that I speak your language. I know your concepts and principles. We're, we're going to be able to get along. Um, but moving into other types of industries. So, you know, I've worked with industries outside of, of human services. They don't know what those letters mean. Right. Actually what they see is extra, extra zeros on the end of my billable hour. Um, <laughs> anytime they see extra letters because they don't know what it means. So uh, when I work with organizations outside of human services, I don't put my BCBA out there because it's, it's not of, of significance to any other industry, but ours. Do you think that credential could hold value if if they start, started being like, oh, this approach, because they had these letters because it came from, came from this area of emphasis and focus, so therefore they would be more likely to look for people with that particular training or? No, no. We, what do we get? You know, seven task list items related to supervision, which is also not OBM. Right. I mean, unless the board was to drastically change the way that they do their certification process, it will not provide any value. Things like the PHR provide value, an MBA provides value, a BCBA does not. And unless the board is going to completely revise what they do, which would not be in the best interest of our clinical counterparts, um, it's just better to keep those kind of separate. Mm -hmm. Any closing questions, guys, before we wind down? Um, you are the CEO of CMO. 
Uh, <laughs> which is going to be name ever, by the way. <laughs> I know, it was such a great name. Uh, what services, just talk about your business real quick, what services do you provide within your organization so when people are out looking for resources, they know uh, what to tap into you for? Sure. So I do a lot of uh, coaching and consultation with human service organizations. I primarily target small to mids small to mid-sized businesses because I feel that they don't get a sufficient amount of support. You know, anybody can afford to pay a consultant thousands of dollars, but those small companies don't have the resources and everybody deserves to have access to good OBM consultation. And that's the only way that our field is going to survive because at the rate we're going, we're going to burn everybody out and, you know, not have anything left. So coaching and consultation is one of my biggest service lines. I also provide a ton of online education and training in performance management, in supervision, um, all, all kinds of different, different course content related to organizational behavior management. Um, and I have uh, employee experience evaluations, which are really intensive uh, uh, employee satisfaction metrics. Awesome. There's just a lot of cool stuff that I get to get involved with as an OBM practitioner. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Secret word number three, employee. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for this lovely talk. I really, I have personally very much enjoyed it. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For sure. Well, thank you all so much for having me. This has just been wonderful. Yay. Our pleasure. For those of you who are tuning in for a CEU, hang on just a moment. You'll get the instructions for how to do that. We hope that you've been listening closely and writing down all of those secret words. So for now, until next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.